to our panelists for joining us today. Thank you to Representative Judy Chu. Uh, hello, Judy, and to KPAC for working jointly on this roundtable discussion. The roundtable will examine the reported racial profiling of Chinese American scientists by the U.S. government, and we'll also look at its effects on the Chinese American scientific community and then on the broader U.S. research enterprise. Uh, my friend uh, and my former colleague, Maryland State Senator and outspoken advocate Susan Lee, described these effects, stating that this kind of racial profiling is, quote, ruining the lives of innocent Americans and their families, but also crippling America's ability to advance scientific and medical innovations that can enhance the quality of life and save lives, especially during the pandemic. Um, our country uh, has, of course, seen extraordinary contributions by uh, the Chinese American community, but it also has a long and sordid history of discrimination against Chinese Americans, of targeting Chinese Americans. And this dates back to the late 19th century when there were multiple massacres of Chinese Americans and uh, multiple discriminatory anti-immigration laws passed that targeted the Chinese community. The legacy of that history is still alive today. And the latest chapter is unfortunately in the alleged targeting and scrutiny of Chinese American scientists. In 1999, the FBI arrested Chinese American scientist Dr. Wen Ho Li and accused him of sharing nuclear secrets with the Chinese government. He was kept in solitary confinement for nine months, but despite a five-year criminal investigation, the FBI had no proof that he was acting as a spy. After Dr. Lee's release, Senate investigations revealed that the FBI based its conclusions about Dr. Lee primarily on his Chinese ethnicity. Counterintelligence and FBI officials confirmed that Dr. Lee was singled out because he was ethnically Chinese. The U.S. District Court judge in Dr. Lee's case even apologized, saying he felt he was led astray by the Department of Justice and the FBI. Other high-profile cases of racial profiling include our panelists here today, Sherry Chen and Xiao Xing Shi, who were falsely accused of espionage in 2014 and 2015, respectively. I'm going to allow them to tell their own stories, but it's important to note that in both of these cases, the FBI harassed them, arrested them, and charged them, but was forced to release them when the Bureau was unable to substantiate their tenuous espionage allegations. It turned out to be a house of cards. Ms. Chen and Dr. Xi are not alone. A 2018 study showed that Chinese American scientists accused of espionage are more than twice as likely as other criminal defendants to be acquitted or to have their charges dropped altogether. While that data predated the Trump administration, Trump's DOJ China initiative escalated the targeting of Chinese Americans. Then Attorney General Jeff Sessions um, introduced this initiative in 2018 to focus on, quote, countering Chinese national security threats. The administration's rhetoric around this program spread fear throughout the Chinese American community that its members would be targeted, not based on anything they had done, but based on their ethnicity. And we should be clear, of course, that nothing we're saying today excuses in any way people acting as actual spies and participating in espionage schemes. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people who have nothing to do with espionage who are being unfairly targeted and blamed for it. The limited data that's been released about the China Initiative indicates that the fears of the community were well-founded. DOJ has prosecuted 61 cases under the China Initiative but only a quarter of them were espionage. Most China initiative cases involving academic scientists were brought for not properly disclosing foreign funding. As our panelists will no doubt explain today, the financial disclosure requirements across the federal government are an inconsistent jumble of ever-changing, ever-mutating guidance, making it difficult for scientists to avoid getting caught up in the FBI's web. Stories like Xiao Ching Shi's Sherry Chen's and Wen Ho Lee's illustrate the reason that we called together this roundtable today. Time and time again, the U.S. government has falsely accused ethnically Chinese scientists of spying for China simply because of their ethnicity or because they still have family ties or other ties in China. 
That is not acceptable in the United States of America, founded on principles of equality and justice. <clears throat> we reject guilt by association. We reject notions of collective guilt or ethnic or racial guilt. The United States is a welcoming place. It is open to people of all backgrounds and to creative ideas and to scientific research and inquiry. Um, that is how we established ourselves as a world leader in innovation and technology by allowing for free flowing thoughts and theories. By targeting people who are ethnically Chinese without evidence, we are hampering our ability to be that world leader and we are harming an entire community. And I know the, the issues here are difficult and complex, um, but I know that we have um, uh, the leadership in Congress and we have the expertise on this panel to seriously and substantively address the problems. I now recognize my friend, the chair of uh, KPAC, Representative Judy Chu of California for her opening remarks. Thank you so much, Representative Jamie Raskin, for hosting today's roundtable, for inviting me to take part uh, on behalf of our Congressional Asian Pacific Caucus, and for shedding much needed light on this issue. From trade to human rights to national security, China poses a number of specific challenges to the U.S., and it's our responsibility to speak up about those differences and fight for our country's interests. But we need to make sure that we don't repeat the mistakes of the Cold War. That means not spreading unfounded suspicions that paint all Chinese people as threats and which put innocent Chinese Americans at risk. That's what makes this uh, an incredibly timely conversation. It was just about 100 days ago when horrific murders at three Asian-owned spas in Georgia shocked the country awake to the reality of anti-Asian violence. The use of xenophobic slurs like Kung Flu demonstrated the way Chinese Americans were used as a scapegoat for a virus that they had nothing to do with. And as a result, we've seen over 7,500 anti-Asian hate crimes and incidents since the pandemic started. But there's another campaign impacting our community that is less understood. It's called the China Initiative. And uh, the ongoing threat, the ongoing threat is unfortunately led by our own government. The China Initiative is unique among Department of Justice investigations. Whereas most investigations start with a crime and then find a suspect, this initiative starts with a suspect and then searches for a crime. Just family ties to China, or even professionally encouraged research and collaboration is enough to trigger an investigation. In fact, this initiative stands out as one of the only DOJ efforts named for a specific country. And so, as a result, simply doing research while Chinese could be enough to have your life and career ruined by a criminal conviction. And that is more commonly known as racial profiling. This has real consequences for the way these investigations play out with chilling effects for both the Chinese American community and our country as a whole. First, by looking specifically at Chinese scientists, we might be missing real instances of espionage from other countries. As former CIA Director Robert Gates said, China um, is one of numerous countries, probably a dozen or 15 countries that steal our technology. Um, but it was FBI Director Christopher Wray that called China um, as one that required a whole of society response. That is exactly the kind of language that leads to widespread mistrust of Chinese Americans. Second, this initiative prioritizes convictions, not justice. And that too often is meant bringing a case without sufficient grounds something that has ruined the lives of those here today and many others, people like Dr. An Ming Hu. Dr. An Ming Hu was born in a village in China, received his PhD in physics in 1997. He continued his research in Germany and Japan before completing his second PhD in laser physics in Canada, where he gained citizenship. It was in 2013 when he was hired by the University of Tennessee, Knoxville where he applied for permanent U.S. citizenship and was promoted thanks to his tireless and excellent work.
But to the Department of Justice, the only part of his resume that mattered was his affiliation with China. And in February 2020, Dr. Hu was arrested for espionage. This case was the first case under the China initiative to go to trial. And the results are telling. It turns out that in a year and a half of undercover surveillance of Dr. Hu, the FBI uncovered no evidence of espionage. Instead, all they found was a paperwork error related to university approved summer work with a Chinese university. This was a recording mistake, not espionage. But what was really shocking was that during the trial, one of the FBI agents admitted that his PowerPoint presentation to the university that claimed that Dr. Ch Dr. Hu had ties to the Chinese military was based on falsified information. He lied. The lack of any evidence and the testimony that, that the evidence did, that they did have was false resulted in a mistrial, but the damage was already done. On the weight of the FBI's false evidence, Dr. Hu lost his job and his reputation and blew through all his savings to pay his legal fees. And the suspicion, isolation, and fear took a great emotional toll on him and his family. But there was another consequence as well. Dr. Hu's wife wrote that after seeing his father arrested, their son David, who was studying at the university where his father taught, immediately questioned his future in computer science and ultimately was forced to return to Canada. This is a consequence that I hear every day. Even Chinese American students who have no connection to these investigations are afraid to enter STEM fields, conduct research, or collaborate with Chinese partners out of fear that their lives could be ruined. That's why I'm so grateful for today's conversation on how we can protect our interests without stoking xenophobia. That can start with halting the China initiative. This initiative was flawed from the start by focusing on ethnicity over crime. Ties to China alone cannot be the basis for an investigation that can ruin one's life. The DOJ should be pursuing facts, not race. And we should be encouraging scientific collaboration, not creating a fear of it. Second, we need to stop the Cold War rhetoric. When the Chinese government acts against our interests or values, we can and must speak out, but we need to be deliberate in what or who we criticize. It should be those who are responsible, not all Chinese people that um, are held responsible. And we can't let fear become an excuse to rob Chinese Americans of their civil liberties. There are still those alive today who were forced into U.S. prison camps during World War II because just being Japanese American made them, in the eyes of the government, unworthy. This policy was wrong then, and a policy of mass suspicion is wrong today. So thank you for today's hearing and for your work to ensure our national security policies are doing what they are meant to, not being used as an excuse to deprive people of their civil liberties. And I yield back. Representative Chu, thank you for that beautiful and comprehensive statement. Um, and uh, I, I truly thank you for your great leadership generally of KPAC and making sure that all of these questions are front and center in our minds as we enter a very dangerous period in American history with a lot of uh, racial and ethnic thinking and stereotyping and uh, hostility and antagonism that's been injected into public dialogue. So now I get to introduce our panelists. Um, our first panelist today is Sherry Chen, who is an award-winning hydrologist. Then we will hear from the Honorable Stephen Chu, who should be well known to many of you. He was the Secretary of the Department of Energy and currently is a professor at Stanford University. We're delighted to be uh, joined by uh, Secretary Chu. And next we will hear from Dr. Randy Katz, who is the Vice Chancellor for Research at the University of California, Berkeley. Thank you, um, Chancellor Katz. And finally, we will hear from Dr. Xiaoxing Shi, the pro a Professor of Physics at Temple University. Um, and with that, Ms. Chen, you are now recognized for your statement for five minutes, and I'm gonna go and run on the uh, run and vote, and I should be back, I hope, by the time, uh, Secretary Chu, it's your turn. If not, I'll ask Judy to introduce you. Thanks. Chairman Roskin. Chairwoman Chu, 
committee and the KPEP members. It's my honor to be here today. I'm Sherry Chen, born in China, and I'm proud to become a U.S. citizen in 1997. I started working for the National Weather Service in 2007. As a hydrologist, my job duty was to produce daily river forecasts and build a forecast model for the Ohio River and its tributaries to improve our flood forecast capabilities. After years of hard work, I successfully developed the model, which has been used by government agencies, universities, and consulting firms. During the record flooding of Ohio and Mississippi rivers in 2011, the model was utilized effectively by the National Weather Service and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to make important decisions and literally help save lives. That year, I was privileged to be selected to receive a national award, Larry Johnson Special Award given to me and a few others for producing life-saving forecasts. I was very proud to serve my country. I could never imagine that my life and a career could be turned upside down three years later. On October 20, 2014, I drove to work thinking it was any other day. Shortly after I entered the building, six I FBI agent suddenly jumped on me and arrested me in front of my co-workers. Unbeknownst to me, someone has falsely reported me as a potential security risk, describing me as a Chinese national. With my arrest, I faced the charges that carried a potential penalty of a 25 year in prison and a million dollar in fines. To my great relief, in March 2015, less than a week before the trial was scheduled to begin, the government announced that it was dismissing all the charges against me. After the charges were dropped, all I wanted was to go back to work, put the nightmare behind me and move on with my life and my family's life. But that never happened. The Commerce Department refused to let me return to work. In March 2016, the agency terminated my employment based largely on the same false allegations leading to my wrongful arrest and the prosecution. My life was turned upside down once again. I challenged the, the termination by filing appeal with MSPB. After a full hearing, the judge issued a decision in my favor in April 2018 the judge rejected the agency's false allegations and charges against me and ordered the Department of Commerce to immediately reinstate my employment. Throughout the decision, the judge highly critical about the wrongdoing of the officials at multiple levels of the agency. Ultimately, the judge concluded that I was a victim of a gross injustice. After the court decision, several dozens of members of Congress and over a hundred of community organizations sent a letter to the Commerce Department, expressed their, their concerns over my case, but the agency ignored the concerns. Instead of issuing an apology and uh, complying with the court decision, is a filed appeal. Until now, my life is still in limbo. My reputation is still under a cloud. The ordeal has taken away precious time in my professional career, and I can never recover the year I have lost. The injustice has now entered its 10th year, and sadly, there is still no end in sight. I keep fighting not only for myself, but to do my part to make sure no one should have ever be harmed because of their race or country origin. Thank you. And now uh, we are pleased to call upon uh, Dr. Stephen Chu. Thank you, um, Chairman Raskin, Chairman Chu, members of the subcommittee and members of the CAPAC. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here before you today. 
My name is Stephen Chu. I'm the William R. Kennan Professor of Physics and Professor of Molecular and Cellular Physiology at Stanford University. I was the co-recipient of the 1997 Nobel Prize in Physics and was the U.S. Secretary of Energy in the Obama administration from January 2009 until the end of April 2013. Chinese immigrants have added immensely to our scientific and technological excellence. This includes six first-generation Chinese-American scientists who received Nobel Prizes in physics or chemistry and two second-generation scientists. First or second-generation Americans were instrumental in founding 44 of the top 100 Fortune 500 companies listed in 2018, including the founders of Yuhu, NVIDIA, YouTube, DoorDash, Old Navy, Peloton, and Zoom. My parents were born in China and came to the U.S. as graduate MIT students during World War II. My two brothers and I were born in the U.S. And after the People's Republic of China was founded in 1949, they remained in the U.S. My father was a professor, professor of chemical engineering at Polytechnic University in Brooklyn for over two decades. But yet he felt racial bias, despite the fact that he consulted for the Redstone Arsenal, Department of Energy, Argonne National Labs, and worked at North American Rockwell during the development of the Minuteman III missile, which still remains part of the American nuclear arsenal. My father's oldest sister, Edith Chu, received her PhD from the University of Michigan before becoming a professor of chemistry at Peking University. And in the book, The Study of Change, Chemistry of China, 1840 to 1949, the author referred to my aunt as, quote, the most significant female Chinese scientist of this era. However, as a woman and a Chinese immigrant, she can only get a job in 1949 at a small women's college in Los Angeles training high school teachers. Despite this humble position, she was able to secure NIH funding and publish papers for decades in the United States. I've never felt any racial bias in my professional career, but I'm very disheartened to see how easy it is to stir animosity and distrust against Asian Americans, as shown by the unjust persecution of my fellow roundtable panelists, MIT professor Gong Chen and University of Tennessee professor An Ming Hu. China has emerged as a major economic competitor and the unprincipled theft of intellectual property by Chinese individuals, companies, and the government is very real. However, this legitimate concern has spilled over into distrust of Asian Americans who, like my parents, have made the United States their home. Many of my Chinese American colleagues feel that they are under increased and unjustified scrutiny by the U.S. government. The Department of Justice's China Initiative and statements by U.S. funding agencies is creating an atmosphere of fear and intimidation. As an example, part of a September 2020 Department of Energy order, it states that prior approval is required before the acceptance of an honorary degree from Chinese universities, even though the honor carries no financial remuneration, is not a reward of past interactions, nor carries any future obligations. I do not believe these actions are in the best interests of the United States. We should be able to deal with the unethical behavior of individuals, companies, and countries without endangering our ability to attract and retain the world's most talented science students and professionals. The 2019 Jason Report, Fundamental Research Security, commissioned by the National Science Foundation, reported as of 2017, 40% of PhD students in science, health, engineering fields were foreign, and China alone counts for 34% of this total. For decades, a large majority of these U.S.-trained PhD graduates stayed because we were at the forefront of many areas of science because of our freedoms. In many important technologies, such as artificial intelligence, new materials, batteries, biotechnology, foreign students have played an essential role in keeping the United States competitive. Today, the global competition to attract and retain the best scientific talent is intensified. We cannot assume the best scientists will still come to the United States or if they come, they will want to stay. We are in an international competition to attract the scientific and engineering talent 
that has been a pillar of our economic prosperity. I believe that scientific creativity flourishes best in a free and open society, and where observations and experiments remain the ultimate arbitrator of scientific truth. In the US legal system, there are checks and balances that ultimately rely on the sound evidence and enlightened judgment to uphold the rule of law and protect the innocent. In so doing, we will honor the words of Abraham Lincoln in his first inaugural address when he appealed to, quote, the better angels of our nature. Thank you for our attention. Thank you, Secretary Chu. And next, um, Vice Chancellor, Dr. Randy Kautz. Subcommittee Chair Raskin, Caucus Chair Chu, and other respected members here today, thank you for the opportunity to share my observations on this important matter. The opinions expressed are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of my institution. I am very concerned about the recent federal investigations into foreign influence. My Berkeley Chinese American colleagues reported to me occurrences of suspended funding for investigators who had collaborated with Chinese universities. There are indications that proposals submitted by Chinese American researchers have been subjected to more intensive review. The funding rate for Asian Americans is lower than for their Caucasian colleagues. These observations are deeply troubling. I can speak from experience of one federal agency investigation in Berkeley. Initially, the agency informed me that one of our faculty had a significant affiliation with an institute in China and that we should investigate it for a conflict of commitment. I performed an extensive Google search for the institute and our faculty member's name. Other than a large number of co-authored publications, which had appeared in the open literature, I found no suspicious affiliation. I reported my findings. The agency responded by producing a set of web page screen images that suggested the individual had an affiliation with the institute in question. It was never made clear how the agency found these pages or why they had not shared them initially. I believe the affiliation was honorific, not unlike a visiting professorship, and did not suggest a conflict. The agency then requested that I investigate whether the faculty member had received funding from China for work that had already been federally funded, a violation of agency rules. After extensive investigation, I concluded that the collaborative work with Chinese colleagues was independent of that performed under US sponsorship. The agency remained unconvinced. Let's be clear. There have been abuses. Those who have violated university or government rules should be punished. In my case, at the worst, the faculty member had omitted disclosing their related but independent work with Chinese colleagues. The agencies have not been entirely clear and consistent on such disclosure matters. These rules are just now being clarified. And in my role at Berkeley, we are communicating these requirements to our research community and assisting them to be in compliance. To avoid the displeasure of the agency, which can make or break a researcher's career, the faculty member agreed to forego submitting a proposal for a period of time. Clearly, these investigations have a particular focus on Chinese American researchers. The faculty member at Berkeley is Chinese American. He was born in China, yet his entire scientific career has been spent in the United States. This person came under suspicion because of extensive collaborations with Chinese researchers. For some fields of science, the best collaborators are in China. Let me reiterate, the joint work was never secret, but appeared in the open venues of science. The agencies have undertaken hundreds of similar investigations, several mentioned during others' testimony today. Some have resulted in job dismissals and legal indictments. 
how many were inconclusive, represented little more than errors of omission, or ended with complete exoneration? No one knows. The public knows only of the most sensational cases. These investigations have been conducted in a manner that does not represent our shared values. Open and transparent processes, an assumption of innocence, and the right of appeal. These and related actions, such as increased interrogation of Chinese Americans by border patrol officers at airports, have a chilling effect on our Chinese American research community. It affects America's international collaborations and our ability to attract the world's best and brightest. This will have ramification for America's research enterprise for many years to come. I look forward to further discussion, and I thank you for the opportunity to come before you today. Dr. Katz, thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it over to now Professor Xi. Chair Raskin, Chairwoman Chu, members of the subcommittee, and members of KPAC, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Xia Xing Xi. I'm a professor of physics at Temple University. Until six years ago, my life story was like many first generation immigrants. I was born and educated in China and married a fellow graduate student there. In 1989, we came to the United States for better career opportunities and a better life. Years later, and two daughters later, we realized that our home is here and our careers are here. So we decided to become American citizens. America has given me the opportunity to reach a level in my profession that I could not have imagined when I was a youngster in China. My American dream was interrupted on May 21st, 2015 before 7 a.m while loud pounding on my door woke me up. I ran to open the door and saw many people outside my house. Some were armed and some had a battering ram ready to take down my door. An FBI agent showed me his badge, asked for my name and announced my arrest. Another agent turned me around and put handcuffs on me. In the meantime, the armed agents in bulletproof vests burst into my house, running about and shouting FBI, FBI. They pointed their guns at my wife and two daughters and ordered them to walk out of their bedrooms with their hands raised. I was worried to how frightening this must be to them. My younger daughter was only 12 years old at that time. When the FBI agents took me away in front of my family, I had no idea when I would see them again. At FBI's Philadelphia field office, I was subjected to DNA sampling, a mugshot, and a fingerprinting. At the U.S. Marshals Service cell block, I was strip searched. At the end of a two-hour interrogation, the FBI agent finally told me that I was charged for having made a device called pocket heater for a Chinese collaborator. I said immediately, that's absurd, because there was no way it was true. I was released on bail late in the afternoon. As we pulled into our driveway, the FBI agent was waiting for us with a search warrant. For the next two hours, we watched FBI agents searching every corner of our house and carting away our belongings. Based on four emails I had sent from my Temple University address, the government charged me with four counts of wire fraud for passing sensitive U.S. company technology, the pocket heater, to China. The charges were totally false. I had never shared the pocket heater information with anyone in China. The emails I had sent were about academic collaborations based on my own widely published research. They weren't about the pocket heater at all. After leading experts in my research field provided affidavits to affirm that the emails in question were not about the pocket heater, the government dropped the case. But our life had been wrecked professionally, emotionally, physically, and financially. One day I was a respected researcher and department chair Overnight, I was painted as a Chinese spy all over the news and the internet and faced the possibility of up to 80 years in prison and $1 million fine. I could not appear on campus, could not talk to my students, and I was no longer the principal investigator of my research grants. We were isolated and worried about my career, reputation, our livelihood, the mounting legal fees, and even my personal safety. Today, we are still living under constant concern that the government is reading my emails and listening to my phone calls, and anything I do could be twisted 
as a reason to charge me. My research has suffered significantly because of this fear. People have asked me, how can the Department of Justice avoid wrongly accusing innocent people like they did in your case? My answer is that they can't, unless they stop considering Chinese professors, scientists, and, sci and students as non-traditional collectors or spies for China. For example, in all the criminal cases involving university professors under the China Initiative, the DOJ has shown no evidence, zero, that those charged have stolen intellectual property, yet they are being prosecuted for felony crimes. I want to emphasize that whether the US and China are in a cold war or hot war, it is wrong for the law enforcement to profile Chinese scientists based on where they come from. I applaud the Biden administration for its actions against anti-Asian violence, xenophobia, and bias. And I call upon it to declare publicly that all Chinese professors, scientists, and students are not non-traditional collectors or spies for China. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for that very eloquent, powerful statement, Dr. Xi. Uh, now we're going to move to a questioning, and I'm going to recognize myself uh, for several. Actually, um, Judy, if you've got questions, I'll let you go first, and I'll go after you. Do you have questions, Representative Chu? Of course. <laughs> Please, you go first. <laughs> OK. Um, well. Thank, thank you to all the witnesses for your uh, uh, very uh, heartfelt words. Um, Dr. Shi, thank you for sharing your story today. It was so heartbreaking to hear about how this false accusation so qu quickly unraveled your life personally and professionally. You mentioned during your testimony that even now, uh, that your case has been dropped, you continue to live with the long-term impacts. Can you please elaborate further on the continued professional, financial, and personal impact that this false accusation had on your life and your family's life? And also uh, the ripple of impact on the academic climate overall. Thank you, Congresswoman Chu. Um, yes, uh, I mentioned that uh, even today we live in fear. And uh, we, you know, um, after quite some times uh, after my case was dropped, anytime when there were people uh, knocking on our door, I cringed. And, and uh, we are afraid of something bad is happening. And even today, as I said, uh, we worry about uh, being monitored and anything, you know, what, whenever we send emails and uh, make phone calls, we think about what we say and assuming that uh, this will be listened by the government and anything we do uh, could be twisted and charge, charge us. And, and so um, not just a, a psychological uh, impact, um, you know, the, uh, the extreme stress that we lived through during that four months that we are fighting for my innocence. Um, I, I, I saw my wife's house taking a turn for the worse. And even today, she has to deal with all these uh, pains and uh, problems. And, uh, a, 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 and we have to live with that for the rest of, my, um, of, of our lives. And so my, my older daughter was a chemistry major and she's not doing uh, not chemistry, um, but uh, uh, things related to the civil rights. And, uh, and, and we all suffer from this experience. And uh, not just me, and uh, of course my, my family suffered a lot, but uh, my students suffered uh, because you know, they, their uh, thesis was thrown into uncertainty sadly. And uh, my university suffered because I'm no longer as a productive uh, um, uh, you know, researcher as I used to be. And I, uh, without a, a funding, uh, I cannot educate it, uh, the next generation workforce for the United States. And, and the United States suffered uh, because of that and uh, because you know, uh, I am not uh, as productive as I used to. So um, my false, the false prosecution uh, um, 
of myself had uh, a huge impact on me, on my family, and beyond. Thank you. And Ms. Chen, thank you for being with us today. Just last month, news broke about a counterintelligence unit within the Department of Commerce that was profiling individuals with Chinese ancestry. This unit, called uh, the Investigations and Threat Management Division, collected information on hundreds of people inside and outside the department using tactics like searching employees' offices at night and running broad keyword searches of their emails just to surface signs of foreign influence. Can you share more about your ongoing litigation efforts and how this news may have added to existing concerns about racial bias and discrimination within the agency? Oh, unmute, um, Ms. Chen. Sorry. Um, yes, my case ha um, is a one of the examples of uh, government uh, ethnic profiling of uh, Asian American scientists. My case have uh, everything to do with uh, my China connection. If you took out that connection, my case would not have ever been brought in million of years. Uh, my case started from someone reporting me as a Chinese national. Then the, the, uh, the security office at the Commerce, they were targeting uh, Asian American employees. Based on a letter we received from a whistleblower uh, at the Commerce, I was targeted as well because I had a family in China and I went to China visiting them. So everything have a China connection would be viewed, treated differently. So the, the security office, they were determined to fund uh, crimes. Uh, and they, for doing so, they prepared a, a misleading investigation report, uh, which also failed to disclose excavatory evidence. And uh, this, this report laid a foundation for my wrongful arrest and uh, prosecution. And uh, based on what we know now, they have been targeted uh, many uh, Chinese Americans. They look at their email, uh, check their computer, and uh, open their office and uh, check around during the night. And uh, they, they have uh, abused their power and not just uh, uh, target the Chinese Americans. So they even didn't have uh, the authority to conduct uh, in the criminal investigation, but uh, they did it. They not only did mine, which is a, you know, it's a, like a seven hour of an interview without uh, my, my council present, no food, no water, no bricks. Oh. Then, the same agent did the same thing to another Chinese American scientist at the agency. Dr. Chen, I'm, I'm, thank you for telling us that. Um, Representative Shu, did you have anything else you wanted to say? Uh, no, I know that my time is up, so I yield back. You're very kind. Okay, um, I, I wanted to start with, with this. Uh, I've been really just shocked and saddened by these stories. Um, the one that that Professor Chen just told us and Dr. Xi, yours. I want to be clear about this. Um, Dr. Xi, you are a U.S. citizen, like Dr. Chen, right? Um, so what was your experience going through this being treated like, um, I don't know, like a foreign spy? Well, I mean, um... How did you? How did you relate to that? I uh, I couldn't believe it. Of course, when it happened to me, and uh, I was uh, uh, I grown up uh, in, during Cultural Revolution in China, and I've seen similar things happening then, and uh, that experience in some way protected, uh, prepared us uh, because uh, during Cultural Revolution, many people uh, could not uh, take it anymore. They either uh, kill themselves or, or they, 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 they died from uh, their suffering. 
Uh, and so they lost their chance to clear their name. So we, you know, my wife and I, we, we were clear. We had, we had to live through this and we had to fight for our innocence. Well, thank you for doing that because it was uh, an Orwellian uh, policy and it was a Kafkaesque experience that, uh, that you went through. Um, Secretary Chu, um, the Trump administration revoked visas for thousands of Chinese graduate students. Um, the move was focused on students with ties to the People's Liberation Army, but it sparked fears, I know, of a possible new Red Scare. I wonder if you can tell me how that affected um, people in the scientific community um, and how it relates generally to the problem of racial and ethnic profiling. Well, it had a polling effect, uh, clearly. Um, it's the, um, it was sort of guilt by association. Uh, there was no evidence that these students actually uh, were doing anything uh, having to do with collecting of information inappropriately or otherwise. They were just simply students. And because their university did have some ties uh, with the, what, um, the China initiative would call something like the fusion of the military and academic enterprise, uh, they were considered guilty. So, so these things are very scary, as you and Representative Chu point out, this is not part of a normal American society. Uh, it's, um, it's tragic. It reminds me of McCarthyism, but in a time um, where uh, it now has a racial bias and slant to it, uh, and also irrational charges being floated around uh, without ultimately uh, backing up. I'm hopeful that the U.S. justice system will uh, begin to react to this uh, uh, more strongly. It already has. And uh, unlike autocratic countries, uh, victims uh, like the ones on our panel can have recourse. Well, thank you very much for that. I wanted also to talk about the role of um, the anti-Chinese fervor and hysteria whipped up around COVID-19 uh, has played here. And uh, Dr. Katz, perhaps I can come to you on this one. Um, but one reason that I found that the, all of the talk about the China virus and Kung flu and all of these things by Donald Trump and unfortunately way too many people in his party who followed him down that road. One of the reasons that troubled me so much was because when I went back and looked at President Trump's statements about the performance of the Chinese government in COVID-19, he was constantly defending the Chinese government and saying they were doing a great job, a magnificent job. Uh, General Xi was just doing a wonderful job. It was all worked out and so on. That was January, February, March, April. And then well, yeah, of course, he, you know, Trump did very little to protect us against the disease. It's running rampant. We're starting to lose, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And at that point, he begins to whip up the fervor about the China virus and the Kung flu and uh, all of that stuff. So it wasn't targeted at the Chinese government. It wasn't targeted at any particular officials. On the contrary, he was protecting them. It was really targeted at ethnicity or a people. And I wonder what, what effect that has had in academia and in science. And then I'm going to move on to uh, my next colleague, I think. Uh, Thank you, Congressman Raskin. I, I just, I just want to say that the general rhetoric around competition with China or COVID-19 coming from China creates a very negative environment for, ch for Chinese Americans, I think, writ large in the United States, but also in the, in the research community, in, in the university and academic community. Uh, uh, the sort of projection that they have some responsibility for uh, the spread of the disease or that they are uh, channels of information back into China is so inherently unfair. Um, uh, and, and I know from my colleagues on my campus, they have experienced uh, epithets and, uh, you know, sort of tasteless jokes and so on about, uh, you know, the, the sort of uh, implications that they somehow contributed to the global situation with respect to COVID-19. 
I, I also want to say that it, it was in my testimony that let's face it, the world's experts on these kinds of infectious diseases are to be found in China and that it is very important to engage with the world's best researchers as a global enterprise to understand what's going on and to develop responses to it. And uh, while it's also true that maybe in China they haven't always been forthcoming with what they know, the importance of that continued collaboration on fundamental research issues is so important not only for the United States but for the world in areas such as infectious disease. Um, thank you. Uh, I now yield to Congress, Congressman Liu, who's next, and then I believe it's, well, well, well Congressman Liu, you're next. You're recognized. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Congressman Raskin and uh, Congressman Chu for setting up this important uh, roundtable briefing. I think it's so important to highlight uh, this issue for the American people. I just want to start off by noting that uh, the National Park Service, uh, you go on their website, uh, at the Manhattan Project National Historical Park, uh, they list the first lady of physics, uh, Dr. Chen Sheng Wu. Uh, she came from China, and she was one of the prime reasons America was able to execute the Manhattan Project. And so I think it's very important to understand the contributions, uh, as uh, all of you know, uh, of scientists from around the world that come to the United States and help the United States. And so... Um, Professor Katz, I've got a question for you. Um, American science and research, uh, it is international uh, at its core, right? That's how we innovate. Professor Katz, I'm sorry, did you oh, hear me? Oh, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I was looking for a question there. Yes, um, uh, the, the, it, it is important that we engage globally in our research endeavors. Uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, there are, there are many fields of science and technology where, where China is frankly in the lead. And of course, the activity of the government to, to sort of uh, uh, reinvest in R&D is an effort to catch up and surpass China in many areas. But we can learn as much from them as they learn from us. And so it's important to recognize that going forward. I, I also need to point out that a large percentage of our scientific and technical workforce in our leading research uh, institutions like Stanford, like Berkeley, are from China or are Chinese Americans. And closing off that source of technical talent will have dramatic ramifications for our research enterprise in this country. We're a global activity. We depend on a global workforce. We depend on global collaborations. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking at a letter here from the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. They wrote in opposition to the China Initiative, and they stated that American science is international at its core, but we must do everything within our power to ensure the enterprise is diverse and collaborative. Uh, I'm just curious, Professor Katz, has uh, Berkeley issued statements opposing the China Initiative or raising uh, this issue to the federal government? No, I'm not aware that we have. Nevertheless, our chancellor, provost, and myself have made communication to our campus uh, enshrining as a principle uh, global collaboration and international uh, activities for our research community and, and embracing the international diverse workforce that represents our activities on the campus. Thank you. If you could look into and ask those questions and see if Berkeley might want to issue such a statement. I think that will be helpful. Uh, and then Dr. Chu, um, first of all, thank you for your public service. And in your experience, uh, now that you're at Stanford, a uh, similar question to you, I imagine a lot of the work that benefits American research is done collaboratively, collaboratively with other countries, including China. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, and if you could perhaps raise the issue of whether or not Stanford would like to issue similar statements. I think that would also be helpful. And then uh, Dr. Shi, I have a question for you. Uh, has the FBI ever apologized to you for uh, just making a mistake? Thank you, Congressman uh, Liu, for asking. Uh, no. Is the okay. has, has the Department of Justice ever apologized to you for uh, messing up your life with your mistake? Uh, no. Um, if anything, they have said the opposite. Right. 
um, in, the, in the current document. Got it. Thank you. And um, Ms. Chen, uh, has the FBI ever apologized to you for their mistake? No, actually, I opposed to uh, high FBI official at an international, no, I mean, national conference of an organization. I specifically asked him why they haven't apologized to me. The answer was, we never apologize. We don't apologize. I just note that the federal judge in Wen Ho Lee case did apologize on behalf of the United States of America uh, to Wen Ho Lee uh, for the racial ethnic profiling uh, of uh, Mr. Uh, of Dr. Lee. Yes, that's this correct. does seek to do the right thing and, uh, and at least apologize uh, for for messing up. I also note that we are I'm about to circulate a letter. Um, one of the reforms that Attorney General Laura Lynch put in was to order implicit bias training for the entire Department of Justice. We're going to send a letter, um, actually a sign-on letter, simply asking the Department of Justice if they in fact have implemented that and to give us an update on it. Uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you, Congressman Liu. And I now recognize Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton for her five minutes of question. Uh, thank you, Chairman uh, Raskin, for this very important hearing. I must say, I have learned a lot already. Uh, this um, first question is for Secretary Chu. This racial profiling of Chinese American scientists, I think, is relatively unknown in, in our country. And uh, I, I am concerned uh, that uh, if such scientists are accused of espionage, uh, they may be losing funding. Uh, and if they do, then we could have a brain drain. So Secretary Chu, uh, you have been quoted as saying people are leaving. How widespread an issue do you think this brain drain is right now? And does it affect uh, U.S research as a whole? Uh, it does affect research. Uh, I know of a few individuals who, um, I mean, there's a, some very famous ones, uh, uh, a rocket scientist, in fact, who wasn't getting supported, essentially driven out of the United States, uh, goes back to China uh, because it's the only place where he could get a job. This is decades ago and uh and um help them develop their own missile program uh essentially forced to leave the united states um more recent uh examples uh, include very distinguished uh scientists who have been courted by china but then during this courtship uh, uh very re essentially ridiculous allegations about re research conduct uh uh, charged by the dean, listening to rumor, not even asking for his side of the story. And when he was talking to me, he said, this was making it very easy and how to decide where I was going to go. Uh, uh, young, uh, brilliant postdocs who could have academic appointments in the United States and in China are beginning to think maybe this is not the welcoming place I thought it was and are beginning to take those opportunities. I personally was a postdoc uh, who said, this is near the end of Trump's time, but it, it, she said, uh, I can't say anymore. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm being watched. Uh, I'm gonna take a faculty job at Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, and I said, they're not looking at you, they're looking at me, <laughs> don't worry. Um, but she just couldn't take the pressure. Uh, there are others uh, that are not in my group, but I hear from my colleagues who are brilliant. They could have gone either to top schools in the United States as assistant professors or go back to China, uh, and they've gone back to China. In addition to that, it's just not going back to China or staying in the United States. They're beginning to look at Australia, Canada, Great Britain, uh, any English speaking country, but including Germany, which teaches its PhD courses in English. <laughs> uh, as, uh, in, and so they're looking to those to go to graduate school 
all these countries are delighted. They used to say, we used to get, you know, the sloppy seconds of the United States, and now we're getting fantastic applicants. Uh, this is harming the United States in immeasurable ways. Um, and I said, there, there, yes, there are maybe a few bad actors, but this is not the way to do it. <laughs> well, <laughs> spring drain is costing us. Uh, Dr. Shi, um, um, I, I, I'm amazed by your story. You became an outspoken advocate on this issue. Uh, you suffered for it. Understand you have fortunately been able to return to work to resume your research. Do you think your case has affected your ability to get funding for your research? And, and how has downsizing your lab and research affected your work? Well, thank you, Congresswoman Norton. And uh, yes, this has uh, negatively impacted my research in very significant ways. And uh, my research funding and the size of my research group uh, are both uh, significantly smaller than they used to be. And uh, it's, it's uh, difficult to, to prove that uh, I didn't get funding because of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, my case. But, uh, but as I said, um, the, the fear uh, that uh, remained uh, in my mind uh, is uh, is uh, is uh, debilitating uh, that you know. Uh, any times when I uh, sign uh, any forms, uh, cross any uh, uh, boxes, and so uh, I am scared. Uh, in particular, uh, after seeing that the DOJ has been charging uh, all these other professors just for uh, some, some maybe non disclosure somewhere. And uh, in particular now, you know, uh, it, it's good that the funding agencies are coming up with more clear requirements like what need to be uh, disclosed. But on the other hand, having this long, 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 long list of what need to be disclosed, you know, but why do I want to risk it uh, by missing something somewhere? And, and uh, so that that's uh, affecting uh, of course, uh, first of all, affecting uh, any collaboration. So people just think, oh, well, why do I want to collaborate with China? If I miss that somewhere, you know, being a consultant for some provincial language school could land me in jail. I mean, why do I want to do that? And, and uh, so that has a huge negative impact on my research. Well, my time has expired. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Chairman Raskin. Thank you, Ms. Norton. I go now to Congressman Chicano, who's recognized for five minutes. There it is. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Raskin. Uh, I am so moved by your leadership uh, and your remarks about uh, uh, that we're not a country that uh, embraces guilt by association or collective guilt. And, uh, you know, I'll note that, uh, you know, my own parents were little children. Uh, when they were considered um, enemy aliens, uh, even though they were American citizens, uh, enemies of the state, uh, when they were interned during World War II, uh, as were my grandparents. And um, uh, to be uh, considered disloyal uh, or to be suspected of being disloyal merely because of one's racial characteristics is just an odious to our tradition um, as uh, a democratic republic. Now, you know, uh, Ms. Chen, um, your, your struggle, your struggles and travails with the Department of Justice began in 2016, is that correct? Uh, yes, I was targeted in 2014, and uh, they dropped the charge uh, a few of, like uh, five months later in March 2015. So these, this was not the uh, this was not the initiative at the this was not falling under the China initiative. This was under a Justice Department under President Obama. Is that correct? Yes, I think so. I, I'm not trying to make an implication that uh, that that there's nothing wrong with or there's nothing uh, to be concerned with with the China initiative. But I, I'm pointing out in my questioning that uh, there seems to be a kind of uh, 
uh, a sentiment within the FBI or within the Department of Justice uh, that uh, predates the Trump administration. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chu, uh, Dr. Chu, um, uh, and other witnesses, um, what uh, is, are, are my observations correct that this is something that is sort of spans administrations? Yes, you are right, uh, especially in the tail end of the second term of President Obama. Uh, there was an upping of the ante of concern, uh, largely driven by Congress, but there was a gathering concern and bandwagon, and, and we were beginning to uh, forget that we're a nation of laws and, and you're innocent to proven guilty, and, um, and all of the principles that this country has stood by. And so I, I'll note that the, the, the last two years of the Obama administration, the, the Congress was controlled in both chambers by Republicans. And I did notice as a member, I, I, was, I, I was in the Congress at that time as well, uh, that there seemed to be a rising chorus and it seemed to be a bipartisan uh, chorus uh, uh, of, of, um, of sentiment rising against China. Um, but as we speak, I, I note that the ports in LA seem to be full of Chinese manufactured goods and we're not decoupling from China economically, uh, but there seems to be uh, you know, a, a political uh, and social sentiment that uh, is, is, is rising. Um, you know, um, Congressman Liu asked, uh, asked Ms. Chen and Mr. Xi whether or not uh, the Justice Department or anyone had apologized to them. Um, I'll note that the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 was an act of Congress uh, which officially apologized to every uh, uh, Japanese uh, American or Japanese immigrant that was interned uh, and compensated them uh, for the injustice done. It was it was a it was a number arrived at twenty thousand dollars. Although it, it paled, I'm sure, Doctor. From what I'm hearing, or what the suffering that you, Ms. Chen and uh, Doctor Shi, both Doctor Chen and Doctor Shi, you've suffered. Uh, probably economic losses way greater, way greater than, uh, than, than than twenty thousand dollars, I'm sure. Um, but nevertheless, there was there was a compensation, and then there was an education fund. But what precipitated um, uh, the the law of 1988 was a presidential commission. I'm wondering if we need to establish a presidential commission to examine uh, the abuses uh, and injustices of what happened, so that. As, as, as my colleague Eleanor Holmes Norton said, I don't think this is widely known, uh, uh, what has happened to uh, Chinese American uh, scientists uh, and the consequences. I wonder if we need to raise the profile. Uh, Ms. Chen, what do you think about that idea? I think it's a wonderful idea. I think, uh, you know, there are so many victims. The Congress may, may want to consider financially uh, it, like uh, compensating all the harm by the government, uh, the harm ca uh, caused by the government. Uh, this could, yeah, just could be um, in the same spirit as the 1988 Civil Liberty Act to compensate the Japanese American during World War II. Therefore, no one would ever forget what has transpired and the injustice should never happen again. Mm -hmm. I, I thought this is a really good idea. Well, it was preceded by a commission, a presidential commission, which examined the uh, the impact of the war wartime relocation uh, and incarceration of American citizens. Uh, Senator Inouye did not specifically say Japanese, but but he he he, he was referring to them. I'm wondering if we need to create such a commission. Um, I'm wondering um, uh, whether or not. Um, uh, you know, that raising the profile of this issue and allowing uh, the, uh, the people who have been wronged to be able to come and testify before such a commission. Uh, and that commission starts to make recommendations. I, I, I'll tell you what, I'll yield back, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, but I do want to make one comment that I, I don't have a lot of faith in the Department of Justice or the FBI just doing uh, trainings for implicit bias or explicit bias. 
I think there has to be a deeper examination of the attitudes uh, and the types of people that uh, populate uh, some of these uh, really important po uh, positions of authority and power uh, and the abuse and the bad judgment uh, that was displayed. Um, uh, there's a deeper problem here. And I'm worried, I'm worried that this is not just a Democratic or a Republican or a Democratic or a Trumpian problem. Uh, that, uh, and so that I'll, I'll yield back with those, with those thoughts. Can, can I comment? Oh, 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 Dr. Chu, you want to comment? Or, or Dr. Xi, you want to comment? Um, yeah, I, I think the, the Dr. Uh, Congressman uh, Takano, um, it, you, it, it's, a, it's an excellent question. I don't think it's a partisan issue. It's an American ideal issue. Uh, and I, I'm so thankful that you brought up uh, your parents' experience during the internment. And I'm sure uh, uh, when, when the government sent the Japanese uh, to internment camp, they, don't, they didn't ask whether you are Republican or, or Democrat. And uh, so um, I, I think, uh, you know, the commission will be a, a great idea, but uh, uh, the first thing that uh, the Biden administration can do, as I mentioned, is to declare publicly that all Chinese professors, scientists, and students are not non-traditional collectors or spies for China. That's the root problem of all these cases that we are seeing. Thank you. Can Thank I you, Dr. Xi. One comment? Uh, uh, yes, of course. Oh, okay. The, for the, the 1980 the Civil uh, Liberty Act, the Congress also offered an apology to the victims. So I think the, the United States should apologize to the victim of the uh, today, uh, as they did before. They should do that. Besides the economic, uh, the, the the have financial compensation, they need to apologize. Well, uh, Doctor Shen, I, I certainly hope that the government, when they restored your job, that they also looked at uh, any back pay that they owed you for the unjust. Uh, denial of your being able to return to work at the at the Department of uh, was it Commerce or the Department of uh, um, yeah um, um, uh, Chairman Raskin I, I apologize for going over my time and um, I just I w would like to yield back. I can't hear you, Chairman Raskin. <laughs> You're muted. And, uh, I was going to uh, call Representative Chu. All right, just uh, she's got some wrap up questions. Yes. Um, well, Dr. Shi, uh, a few weeks ago, you met with the members of our Congressional Asian Pacific Caucus, which I chair. You spoke about these false accusations and the China initiative overall, and you gave us a plethora of information about what's going on with these cases. And you wrote an article saying the U.S. should listen to scientists about how to counter influence from China. What would be a better way of countering influence from China? What would you do if you were in control of everything? I, I think that, the, thank you, uh, Congresswoman uh, Chu, uh, for brought, um, bringing that up. And uh, I, I think the government should do is to follow the recommendations of the Jason report uh, that, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, the, Secretary Chu has uh, mentioned uh, that was a commission by the National Science Foundation. Um, they have access to all the classified and uh, unclassified into, uh, intelligence information. They evaluated uh, what happened uh, in, in terms of uh, undue influences of China to American research. They concluded that the, uh, the, these bad things happened, uh, but how frequently they happen is not very clear. And they recommended that a lot of problems uh, should be treated uh, like, uh, uh, you know, scientific misconduct, uh, in, you know, by the universities and uh, funding agencies. So I, I think that that should be the way to do it. Uh, and, uh, uh, it, it, you know, the, the, this non-disclosure problems, and also in the examples uh, that I gave uh, the KPAC in the briefing, uh, there are things like uh, travel reimbursement, you know, uh, uh, flight receipts, and there are some uh, the uh, 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 J-1 visa uh, documents and these kind of things. You know, um, I, let, let's say non-disclosure. Uh, it's 
that, you know, at worst, it's scientific misconduct. And very often, the, the rules of what to disclose uh, is not clear. But at worst, it's a scientific misconduct. It's not national security crime. And I think the, the FBI knows it, and DOJ knows it, and the funding agency, NIH, knows it, and the universities know it. But you know, uh, under the, the uh, assumption that uh, Chinese uh, professors, scientists, and students are spies for China, and then they just find anything to charge these people. And uh, you know, uh, one one former FBI agent uh, has said that, that this is the strategy strategy of uh, interrupt, uh, disrupt, and the damage. Uh, and uh, before they got any uh, evidence, as I mentioned, the DOJ has shown zero evidence that any of these professors charged under the China Initiative uh, has stolen intellectual property. So they just find anything to charge them. So that's wrong. And uh, as other panel panelists have pointed out, that this hurt American research uh, in very significant ways. So uh, I think uh, how they should deal with it, uh, the, the, the best way is uh, follow the recommendations of Jason report and uh, uh, treat it, uh, treat the non-disclosure as uh, uh, you know a scientific misconduct, and only for those uh, really bad cases that people willingly provide false information, then refer that to the FBI. Not that the FBI is driving this prosecutions of these professors, and, and uh, so that's um, you know that that's what I would uh, recommend. Uh, Secretary Chu uh, and Dr. Katz, do you have thoughts on this? What would be a better way of countering that influence? I would like to, you know, again refer to to my testimony where I said that that the current investigations do not represent American shared values. We do not have an open and transparent process. We do not have an assumption of innocence, and we do not have a right of appeal before the FBI charges through your front door at seven in the morning while you're, you and your children are in their pajamas. I mean, this, this process uh, of, of how the investigations have taken place is so inherently unfair and un-American in my view, that's where we need to start. What is the process of making an accusation? How is it reviewed? Uh, 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 what is the level that it has to reach before you have the kind of experience that uh, Ms. Chen and Dr. Xi have, have experienced uh, to invoke the, the FBI to come knocking on your door in the middle of the night. Uh, this is what I'm greatly concerned about. If you ask the Department of Justice or any of the federal funding agencies, which are, are you know, the source of information that led to these investigations, what your process is, they would be hard pressed to explain it to us. And that's where I think we need to begin. So, in my opinion, I think um, uh, some of the rules make sense. I mean, if I were a funding agent, whether it be the NIH or the Department of Energy or NSF, I would want to know whether my scientists are getting funding for similar work with other funding agencies. I think that's a legitimate question and they should be all be declared. But then uh, they're beginning to pile up all sorts of other disclosure rules. Um, most of us did not know if we go and give a talk at a university, whether domestic or foreign, and you just pay for our airfare, uh, and we don't disclose it, this has now become an offense that could actually get you in felony court. Uh, and I'm not talking about honorarium, that's, that's something you have to declare for income tax matters. I'm talking about just reimbursement, uh, pay for a meal after you gave a talk at a dinner, all of these things. Being able to list all these things is becoming more and more onerous. It seems quite as though lots of rules are being made or clarified. Another rule that's been clarified is it doesn't have to be any having anything to do with money. It could be uh, uh, collaborations or interactions in kind. If you get a sample from another lab that is not commercially available, you have to declare this. Well, the irony of that is in many of our scientific journals, for example, in Science, which is published by the AAAS, of which I was the president and chair of, you have to say if you publish an article 
and some other scientist wants your reagents or whatever, you give it to them. And now all of a sudden, <laughs> funny agents are saying, if you get some material like that, that's not commercially available, you have to declare it. And if you don't declare it, then you could be in trouble. So there's all sorts of little infractions being built up that most of us are dimly aware of. Universities are scrambling to try to keep up with these things. But uh, you know, most of us know that if you change lanes while going through an intersection, you're in a traffic violation. It's a moving violation. And maybe everybody should be arrested for these things. But you make up even more rules <laughs> to get people. And it makes no sense. It's driving the cost of compliance up. It's driving headaches all around. And it seems that they're being made up to be able to catch someone. It's espionage we're worried about. Industrial espionage, national security espionage. And this, these little things, which are, are misdemeanors that should be as, uh, as treated as uh, anything like any other kind of academic misconduct should be treated in that way. Well, well said, and thank you, and I yield back. Thank you so much, Ms. Chu, and uh, thank you, Dr. Chu, for that excellent explanation. Um, I believe we've been joined by uh, Representative Rashida Tlaib, and I would recognize Ms. Tlaib for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Chairman uh, Raskin. I so appreciate this hearing. Um, and Congresswoman Chu, uh, of course, uh, for your incredible leadership in fighting in all forms of, of hate as a Muslim American in this country and you being the key sponsor to repeal the ban um, truly represents what solidarity against hate in our country looks like. So I really appreciate you. Uh, while the issue of sinophobic profiling um, he was encouraged by forever impeached president uh, through his China, so-called quote China initiative created by, of course, the former attorney general, uh, Jeff Sessions. It further in institutionalized and forma formalized, you know, racial profiling in our country. This combined with Trump's, you know, hate rhetoric about China in the COVID and during the COVID pandemic has put really a target on the back of my, you know, AAPI and, and Chinese American neighbors across the country. Uh, including uh, many of the scientists here today. I also have to mention, you know, again, as a Muslim in a country raising two Muslim boys, I have felt uh, very strongly about being part of this hearing uh, because programs like the so-called China Initiative are the exact same kind of racist, oppressive, hateful programs that I've seen our own government go after so-called black extremists or, uh, you know, uh, people of Muslim faith in our country. The hate that motivi motivates, as you all know, the anti-AAPI um, uh, hate as well, you know, the, the sinophobic, uh, uh, red scare, anti-Semitism, anti-Blackness, Islamophobia in our country and so on. It's all in the same kind of, you know, oppressive um, targeting that is extremely, again, racist. So let's be clear, you know, I think many of us uh, know that, yes, the Chinese government intelligence operations certainly have our national security issues, but using them as an excuse to surveil, harass, and arbitrarily detain and arrest people of Chinese descent is the exact kind of logic that led to the horror of the Japanese internment during World War II. Recently, the judge uh, in the case against University of Tennessee researcher uh, declared a mistrial, an FBI agent leading who, whose investigation admitted that he had falsely accused Hugh of having ties to Ch the Chinese military. One juror even called it the most ridiculous case. But that man's life is going to be forever changed. Secretary Chu, you know, do you think that China initiative has led to an increase in false arrests such as Dr. Hu's? Uh, the simple answer is yes, uh, absolutely led to a number of false arrests. I mean, when people uh, see their superiors saying, go up and round some suspects, <laughs> they will go up and round some suspects. And it's, it, it, with body language, specific language, you name it, uh, uh, they're being told, these are the type of suspects we want. Uh, in, in the guise of what, good politics? Uh, who knows? But it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not who we are. I, I just want to make one other point, and that is, we are playing into the propaganda of autocratic governments mm -hmm. when we do this. That's right. Uh, it, is, it is just saying, you know, if we don't treat people fairly and in the, the ways and principles 
that the world has known for many decades and laps back to things like the Japanese internment days, like, mm -hmm. like the Chinese Exclusion Act days, mm -hmm. like, like McCarthyism. If we lapse back into those very dark periods in our time, they're going to say, do you want to live in that country? <laughs> do you want to do your work there? And it doesn't have to be just Chinese people. It could be anyone. It could be That's someone right. from Great Britain or Australia or Canada or Germany, you name it. Uh, and this is the worst thing that we can do for our own selves. We're not shooting ourselves in their foot. We're shooting ourselves something very part, <laughs> very near here. <laughs> and, uh, and, and if we need to return back to the principles that we all are very proud of and we know about That's and right. send a clear message you know, democracy is sort of on trial. What are crack governments are saying? It doesn't work. Look, doesn't. the way we run our, our country, it works much better. You guys can't do any legislation. You can't do this. You can't do yeah. that. And by the way, you persecute just much worse than we do. No, and thank you. And, and Secretary, I completely agree. And, you know, there have been a number of calls from advocates to end the China initiative. And at the beginning of the year, group of numerous organizations and scientists sent a letter to President-elect at the time, Joe Biden, calling him. Uh, calling on him to end, uh, you know, and I echo uh, those advocates in calling on the administration to end this racist program. Uh, you know, Ms. Chen, since, since you were one of the uh, signatories on that letter, I'd like to end with, you know, two brief questions for you. First, why do you think the Biden administration needs to end it? And second, have any of you received any encouraging signs that the administration has any intention of ending the China initiative that was started by the forever impeached president? Thank you for the increased attention and the trade war between U.S. and China. Many uh, Chinese American scientists and scholars has become uh, collateral damage. The government overreached and uh, the asserted uh, crackdown Chinese economic espionage of the China Initiative program under the theory of a whole of a society uh, threat. That has uh, not only caused uh, the numerous the damage to scientific uh, community and uh, the economic well-being of the United States, but also ruin uh, many innocent lives. I think uh, this is a human cause. So if the program continue as they are now, it will be remembered as another shameful, shameful chapter in our national history as in the past, where the U.S. government targeted the Asian Pacific uh, Americans, such as the Chinese exclusion acts and forced the internment camp of Japanese Americans. So this policy must change. I think that the Biden administration since the first day he came to the office, he uh, already uh, issued several executive orders, try to stop the, uh, the racial profiling and uh, call out the, you know, the wrong things going on. I think I see the light. And uh, I uh, hope uh, today what we discuss is very important. This is a, this discussion should continue and the action to to the to to be followed, and uh, so that uh, for the sake of the the safety of the, the United States and uh, the economic well being. Thank you so much, and uh, Chairman, thank you for your patience. Uh, you. Thank you so much, Ms. Talib. Um, I just have a few wrap-up questions before we uh, before we conclude. Um, Secretary Chu, I wanted to start with you. Thank you for clarifying uh, this whole issue of confusion around disclosure requirements. And I understand the disclosure requirements are not targeted specifically at the Asian uh, American or Chinese American scientists, but um, they create so much ambiguity, uncertainty that they can then be exploited to go after Chinese American scientists. And I think you made the crucial analogy uh, to uh, our system of uh, motor vehicle infractions. And of course the, the famous phrase driving while black um, is all about having 5,000 rules on the road that generally are ignored and people are allowed to go do their own thing. But then if the police wanna target a particular group They've got an encyclopedia to choose from. And yeah, I think you're sort of making th that analogy. It reminded me of a Supreme Court decision called Yikwo versus Hopkins, which was one of the first great equal protection decisions that dealt with Chinese Americans 
where the, the law, which appeared to be a neutral law in San Francisco, was being um, arbitrarily and unequally applied against the Chinese American community. So uh, I thank you for that. And I wonder, you know, what can be done to deal with that problem of these disclosure requirements? Is it the requirements that themselves that are the problem? Or is it the malevolent intent with which they're being carried? I think, um, thank you for the question. I think it, there are things, as I said before, that make perfect sense. You know, full disclosure of where of a researcher, where they're getting their finances from, that makes perfect sense. Um, uh, you know, if you get a lunch from a colleague, uh, do you really have to disclose it? <laughs> uh, you know, and these rules that are being supplemented with frequently asked questions and new orders uh, on a yearly basis, and we can't keep up with them, and it drives inefficiencies. So certain rules make perfect sense. Uh, other rules uh, seem to be uh, means of harassment. So if we can't get you on espionage, at least we can get you on something. And, and this is the problem. And I think, uh, 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 I think the executive branch, the legislative branch should get together with advice from the judicial branch to say what makes sense, what makes sense to carry out the research functions to protect American security interests, to protect American intellectual property rights, but also to make it known we want to remain a free, opening, and welcoming society that will attract the best and brightest from everywhere. The United States has benefited so much from a brain game for a half a century. And we want, are we willing to throw this away? Uh, because the other countries, as I said in my remarks, are quite willing to pick up on this. My have colleagues all around the world, and they're delighted uh, <laughs> that the United States is seeming to just say, well, we, we don't want the best and brightest in science, technology, uh, medical research, um, you name it, uh, especially if they're from Asia. And okay, science. thank you. Thank you so much for that. It's very clarifying. And I've just got uh, a final question uh, or two for Dr. Chen and Dr. Katz. Um, you know, it's bad enough to think that this is taking place within the FBI and the DOJ, but it's not just those departments. Ms. Chen, you're an employee at the National Weather Service, which is part of the Department of Commerce. And last month, the Washington Post revealed that your case was one of many cases that came out of the Department of Commerce's um, Investigations and Threat Management Service, ITMS, which morphed from a service meant to protect the department's officials and facilities into a counterintelligence unit operating, quote, far outside the bounds of federal law enforcement. And it's been accused of racially profiling commerce employees, including by searching for specific Chinese words on the commerce servers to see if they would come up. Uh, Ms. Chen, were you surprised to learn that racial profiling was far more widespread at commerce and at ITMS than just in your case specifically? Uh, it, um, first of all, this uh, couldn't have gone for, for so long for, for, the, for the problem they mentioned if they are not a widespread uh, victory in the commerce. So, and I also want to mention that this is a, a simply not a just a, a issue at the Commerce Department. It is also an extreme issue of a racial profiling at many government agencies. The racial profiling is especially egregious at the National Institute of Health, where over 500 research scientists around the United States has been seriously and cruelly impacted. Well, so, thank you for that. The NIH is in my district and I take a very strong interest in that. And I wanted to ask Dr. Katz how this um, focus on technical disclosure violations with a selective focus on uh, China has affected your institution. Yes, uh, thank you for the question, Congressman Raskin. Uh, I want to also sort of emphasize, how did these investigations begin? We heard uh, senior research officers at American universities like myself heard a presentation from a senior official 
for counterintelligence in the FBI who, who essentially admitted that if where the investigations began were by individuals who had published widely with Chinese researchers. So they start with the publication record and then begin the investigation. And as uh, Dr. Xi has pointed out, they're the, the sort of, in the end of the day, what people are tripped up on are disclosure situations. So I referred in my testimony to the investigations that we did. Is there an un, uh, un, uh, uh, specified affiliation for the individual? I did my Google search. I'm a computer scientist. I'm pretty experienced in these things. I couldn't find anything. Mm -hmm. And then, and then it's followed up with from a federal funding agency, of course, the FBI is behind them, uh, is a set of screenshots. Where did they get those pages from? I couldn't find them. Where's the transparency in how this information was discovered? And so at the end of the day, the individual had done some research with colleagues in China uh, on what I believe and what I, tr what I tried to prove to the funding agency was orthogonal work that, to what they had been funded for, but they, the agency was not convinced. And I have no way to appeal mm -hmm. their opinion. And so now that individual has to forego funding from that agency for a period of time. So and, I, and that really is researching while Chinese American. That's like getting someone for the broken tail light, except there's no appeal. There's no court you can take it to, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I think that this has been an extraordinarily fruitful and illuminating uh, roundtable discussion. And I hope that we will be able to brainstorm in Congress on different ways of uh, dealing with these problems. And we will be in touch with you. And we thank all of you for your outspokenness. And uh, Dr. Chen and Dr. Xi, thank you for your courage. And Secretary Chu, for your service. And Dr. Katz, thank you for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to Representative Chu for any final thoughts she might have. I want to thank Dr. Xi and Sherry Chen for sharing their stories. I want to thank Secretary Chu and Dr. Katz for sharing your wisdom. Uh, and most of all, I want to thank Congress member Jamie Raskin because Jamie Raskin, by doing this hearing today, conducted the very first congressional hearing on this topic, the very first. Now, we in KPAC have been yelling and screaming about this for a long time, but we cannot get the attention on it. And as a result, all these scientists have been suffering in isolation, but their suffering is enormous, as you've heard from Dr. Xi and Sherry Chen, where they've lost their entire jobs, their funding, they've been humiliated in the press and their reputations ruined. And yet um, we have not shined a light on this issue up until now. So you are doing such an enormous service, um, Congress member Raskin, by having this hearing. We want to make sure that we take actions, that there is um, that, that, that there is a broad response to this, that this is wrong. This is racial profiling. This is, uh, this is uh, using the Chinese as collateral damage and thinking nothing of it, you know? Um, so this is the beginning of change. And I wanna thank you for uh, airing these issues and making sure that all of us can really understand the implications of it. Well, <clears throat> Congresswoman Chu, that, that means a lot to me and to our subcommittee, uh, which, which tries to respond to what we're hearing. We've heard so much about this, but thank you for your really extraordinary leadership in bringing KPAC together into such a mighty force in Congress. I'm thrilled to be a member of it. And so again, I wanna thank the panelists for their remarks. I wanna thank Congressman Liu and uh, Congressman Takano, all of our colleagues who joined us today and I want to just, in closing, highlight the many statements from concerned advocates and other experts we received. One is from my friend, uh, State Senator Susan Lee, who really was instrumental in my doing this. And she uh, brought this to me in the context of racial profiling and ethnic profiling historically and the, the broader history of discrimination against the Chinese American community. Uh, I want to thank the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology 
which explained how actions taken by DOJ and research agencies have a chilling effect on international scientific collaboration. I want to thank the group Asian Americans Advancing Justice, which submitted a number of excellent recommendations on how to address the problem of racial profiling. I want to thank the Asian American Scholar Forum, which noted that Asian American professors chose to stay in the U.S. because they believe in democracy, freedom of speech, the rule of law, and the research environment of freedom and exploration without fear, a point that, um, that Mr. Chu made so powerfully. Asian Pacific and American Justice, which explained that whether it's with malice or implicit bias or both, the checks and balances system has failed, not only individuals, but also an entire group of people who are now targeted for their race, ethnicity, and national origin. Um, the Committee of 100, which submitted its white paper and executive summary on prosecuting Chinese, quote, spies and empirical analysis of the Economic Espionage Act. And finally, defending rights and dissent, which raised concerns about the FBI's rhetoric around the alleged threat from Chinese Americans in academia. Oh, and also Patrick Eddington of Defending Rights and Dissent, who expressed the idea that freedom of association and open scientific exchange are absolutely essential to advance human progress. All of these excellent statements will be available on my website following the round table. Um, I want to make sure that my friends out at NIH in Bethesda, Maryland are aware of this round table. I'll make sure that they uh, get all of the information, uh, which is why I sent a letter with um, Congresswoman Chu requesting data from NIH about their investigations last February. We still have not received a sufficient response from NIH, but we are continuing to follow up. And we know that um, they are committed to equity and non-discrimination. And I just hope that they're not getting caught up in the kind of hysteria that the last administration unleashed against a whole community of Americans. So unless there's anything else, I wanna thank you. This was a landmark and historic proceeding as Representative Chu pointed out. Thank you, uh, Chair Chu, for your leadership at KPAC. Congressman Liu, thank you for your service to America and the Congress, as always. And this roundtable is now adjourned.